Hey, Deserving Listeners, it's time for me to continue answering your questions of the Johnny Depp Amber Heard trial as a follow-up to the 50-plus hours of reaction videos that I made. Let's do that now. Ronan says, Do you worry that by giving Amber so much benefit of the doubt, despite the overwhelming evidence against her and her credibility, that you might be unintentionally harming victims that see a lot of their abuser in Amber Heard and her lies? Uh, end of question. Yeah, absolutely. I'm terrified of that. Um, I'm terrified of hurting either end of the spectrum regarding that. And apparently I have done that, which is depressing and, you know, keeps me up at night. And, and by the way, I do a lot to try to mitigate that, right? By saying, I don't know, and it could be true. Like, you know, I a lot of those caveats I say because I don't want people to misconstrue what I'm saying as somehow ammunition against people who step forward, particularly women. You know, I, I hope that that comes across. Your student from another university says, do you agree that Johnny's expert witnesses were of higher quality than Amber's, if not in content of testimony, but also their attitude and ability to remain objective? It seemed many of Heard's experts were not only providing dubious opinions, uh, like that like that hand doctor. Yeah, seemingly, uh, when you compare Curry and Shaw to Hughes and Spiegel and the hand doctors, it seemed like, wow, the Johnny Depp team had seemingly much better expert witnesses. And who knows what why that is. It could be a budget issue. It could be that the data on Amber Heard's side was hard to stand by, and thus the expert people were really scrambling to try to make it work for them. Uh, who, know, who knows? But I will say that Dr. Hughes did a great job. And there's some things that strategically I, I wouldn't have done if I, I were her. But there were a lot of things that she did really well. And if you're biased against Amber Heard, then she's ridiculous and a terrible human being. And there are some things that she did that was strange, like asking to read her report while she was on the stand. Juno says, I am confused about Dr. Hughes' testimony and contradictory findings compared to Dr. Curry's. Can an average person trust these professionals because of their contradictions? End of question. Yeah, to be clear, Curry and Hughes did a great job. They did what they're supposed to do. But yeah, it certainly makes us look bad. At the very least, makes us look like we don't know what we're doing. And at worst, it makes us look corrupt because apparently if you pay enough money, you can get a forensic psychologist to say anything. So yeah, it's not a good look. And I've been talking about that throughout my videos. And it was one of the several reasons why I didn't go into that field. I'm trained as a forensic psychologist, but as I started to get into it a little bit, I was like, yeah. And there were a lot of reasons as to why I didn't like it that I've detailed in other, other videos. Marcus says, how come you seem to still think she is telling the truth about being abused? Please review more of the evidence. Again, it's not really a question, it's more of a, of a criticism, and I get it, it could be wrong, as I've been saying. I don't know if she's telling the truth, one. Two, I don't, I don't understand how people could, could, could conclude from my videos that I believe everything that she says. I mean, if anything, I would think people would be like, wow, you seemingly are against Amber Heard because, you know, and I want to remind people that the main bullying that I'm getting online, people that are trying to take me down are the pro Amber Heard people. So if you believe I'm pro Amber Heard or believing her, like there's a whole other set of people that believe that I don't believe her enough and think I'm ridiculous because of that. So I don't know. I I would think that if people actually watched my videos, they'd be like, oh, well, clearly he has concluded after reviewing the evidence that she's lying a lot of the time, especially about the key incidents of abuse, of, of physical violence. So I don't understand why that's hard to swallow for people. <laughs> it's, it's there. It's what the I, I agree with what the jury, I think, concluded. So, But, you know, I get it, I guess, that I could be wrong about everything and I probably am wrong. I'll tell you, I, I'm positive I'm wrong about a lot of things. I know you all are wrong about a lot of things too, because none of us were there. I mean, clearly there's a lot of people that are wrong because everyone has varying opinions about this. So clearly uh, there's a large set of us that are wrong. And I, I accept that and that's just how it's going to be because none of us were there. Roy says, do you, do you think it's fair to the judge jury verdict and Johnny Depp for Amber Heard to continue her press tour defaming not only him, but misrepresenting the facts? I don't know. But what's the alternative? Do we prevent her from speaking to the press? You know, I don't think so. Could Johnny Depp go after her 
because she is continuing to spread supposed lies or at least alleged lies. Uh, yeah, but what the attorneys will tell me is Johnny Depp has already won. He won the case because he was trying to change the public opinion. He has clearly done that. So why would he do more? And it could be argued pretty well that Amber Heard is not helping herself by continuing to do what you call the press tour. So you go on, I believed you tried to be unbiased as humanly as possible, which is really admirable, but do you think you might have been subconsciously biased towards one side as to offset the secondhand information you got from other sources, wife, internet, and friends. Am I subconsciously biased? That's the main question there. Um, undoubtedly, I'm subcon all of us are subconsciously biased. There's no way around being biased. None of us are objective. It's just obvious. So yeah, I absolutely was subconsciously biased. And I, I tried to, you know, unearth those biases to try to account for them. But by definition, there could be a biases that I didn't manage to unearth, or I just didn't know to even look for. So yeah, I was unconsciously biased. That's that I was I was biased consciously and unconsciously. Uh, regarding my why, I don't know why you're bringing my wife friends uh, into this, but my wife was uh, had a very similar attitude as me. As we started watching the trial, we both basically were concluding that we didn't know, and it kind of seemed like both people were being at least somewhat abusive to each other. But anyway, and then in terms of friends, none of my friends watched the trial. They had no idea what was going on. <laughs> So I wasn't biased by them. In terms of the internet, yeah, the internet could have absolutely affected me because you know, the internet was clearly pro Johnny Depp for the most part. And I tried to account for that. You go on, Amber Heard released a few pages of her therapist notes in her interview. People have found out uh, found out that the handwriting is strikingly similar to her own, and it was written in longhand. Some psychiatrists have commented that they never use longhand, and no therapist will ever write notes in this manner. What is your opinion on, on this? Thank you, Dr. Kirk. And a question. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it could be. It's hard to evaluate handwriting, by the way. But regarding longhand and shorthand, it depends on what you mean by therapist notes. It, it depends on what she means by therapist notes because uh, we have progress notes and treatment plans and assessments and we have another category of notes in which we call psychotherapy notes or, or process notes. So in a nutshell, there's the official record in the file, in the client file, and that official record is accessible to the client. It's accessible to other uh, you know, providers. They can pull the file and, and look at it. When you go to the doctor, your doctor writes a progress note and other doctors and other physicians or yourself, you can actually just look at that. In fact, a lot of those notes are online these days, right? In fact, probably all of them. So those are the progress notes, treatment plans, assessments, and uh, they need to be readable. They can't be in shorthand. Whereas if you are taking process notes or psychotherapy notes, these are notes just for ourselves. And it's allowed within HIPAA to have those because we want physicians and mental health workers to be able to make a little note to themselves without worrying that somehow they have to make it articulate or understandable to other people. And so I could go down a whole rabbit hole in terms of the ethics and the practices around this sort of thing. But so for example, when you're seeing a therapist in that quintessential stereotypical way, keeping notes, that's usually the process notes and those things go in a separate file and they're not accessible to the client and they often are in shorthand because why would you write in full sentences you know like for me with my psychotherapy notes I have all these abbreviations and shorthand things that I write that I know what they mean but other people wouldn't know what they mean or at least they could be misinterpreted but when I write a progress note that goes in the official file for the client to see or for example or the insurance company pulls the file for whatever that's never happened to me but it could happen then all that has to be written in a way that's understandable to everyone. It needs to be in longhand, it needs to be clear, and it can't have abbreviations, and it can't be in shorthand. I mean, some physicians, some mental health people might claim that you could have some shorthand in there, but I don't like that, and I don't I don't do that, and I don't train people to do that. It actually bothers me. For example, if, I, if I'm supervising someone, and I pull their file because I'm overseeing their practice, and a big part of that is monitoring their paperwork, and a big part of that is monitoring what they're doing with their clients, and I look at their progress notes, and I I don't understand what they're saying, well, then that is a bad progress note. <laughs> Even if they write in a shorthand that I think that, that I understand, you know, sometimes with instead of client, it'll be CX in terms of treatment, it'll be TX, recommendations, it's RX, all these kinds of things. 
And uh, although I know what they mean by that, I will tell them don't put that there because if the client pulls their file and they don't understand what's in there, then you have failed in terms of your documentation. In fact, I was trained that your progress notes are supposed to be readable at a 10th grade level. It shouldn't be at your level. As a therapist, you have a lot of education, you've written a lot of things, and you might be able to write things that are very complicated, use you know elaborate vocabulary, but we're trained to write at a 10th grade level, maybe even at an eighth grade level, because your clients might literally be in the eighth grade and be able, they need to be able to read their file as well, but also you don't know people's reading level. So you need to write in a simple way, an understandable way, in a clear way. And it's a big stereotype that isn't true that you know all doctors and all mental health therapists write in this like chicken scratch that it's like impossible to read. That was certainly true in the past, but now it's all computer, so there's not any penmanship issues, right? And also, I mean, there are some some people who still keep hand progress notes, but it's more and more rare as time goes on, particularly younger and newer therapists. Now, could some people claim that everyone they know, including themselves, write progress notes in shorthand? Yeah, I don't recommend that for the reasons I stated, but for people that will come forward and say, like, psychiatrists never use longhand when they write their notes is... It's just not true. Jahain from Morocco says, I see a lot of misinformation spreading on social media about domestic violence victims that might be harmful for victims wanting to come forward. I would love for you to discuss that. Yeah, I feel like I've, I've already discussed that, but yeah, there's a lot of misinformation going around saying like, we knew it, women are evil or they're always lying and borderline people, we need to discount them. Yeah, it's, it's pretty awful. Listener Grace says, do you think that part of the reason it is harder to identify male abuse victims is that many men may have different reactions to abuse than what is currently measured, including less likelihood to report actually feeling unsafe? Do I think that part of the reason it is harder to identify male abuse victims is that many men have different reactions to abuse? Yes and no. It, it's a bit of a myth that men abuse victims, and I hear people talking this way sometimes. They'll say like, well, when women are abusive, they're more emotional. You know, when men are abusive, they're more physical. And certainly there's some research demonstrating there's a tendency, but I think that that misleads people to believe that women who are abusive are not physical, or at least they're not as physical. And on average, they're not. Of the people who murder their spouses as a result of IPV, the vast majority are men. So there are some things, there's some outlier examples that you can point to, but the notion that somehow there's this universal difference, or at least at like a 90-10% difference between men and women regarding how intimate partner violence is perpetrated or the experience of a victim is, I think, misleading. But could a male victim of intimate partner violence be more likely to puff up, to try to stand their ground more often than a, a woman victim? Yeah, even, so even though a man is being victimized, it's possible that given his socialization or his size difference, that he won't look as quintessential as a victim because of those reasons. Yeah, that can happen, and that could have been happening in this case. Listener Lisa from Illinois says, what's the best way to deal with a borderline person who will not accept the outcome of an issue and continues to push it? Like Amber Heard continuing to talk to the media and who knows if she'll ever accept the verdict even if denied at appeal, end of question. So to answer your question, you're saying, you know, what's the best way to deal with a borderline person like Amber for not accepting an outcome of an issue? I don't know if I can answer that question. It's a case by case basis. But if you're asking like, say you're Amber Heard's friend or something, and you're like, I don't think this is wise. Why doesn't she accept the verdict? How come she's going down this road? It's not, it's not helping her. You could see a friend actually believing that about her. How do you deal with that? Well, yeah, you know, compassion, listening, trying to convince in a soft way without triggering the person. It might not work. Uh, patroness Becca, I like that, Patroness Becca from the interwebs says, assuming any of the hypotheses of Johnny Depp and Amber Heard are close to accurate, should either one get into a romantic relationship or should they spend time in therapy first? End of question. Yeah, it's a good question. Sometimes we simplify the recovery or the healthy path to taking a break from relationships. And certainly if people make that decision. There's a lot of wisdom to that. But somehow saying that 
if Johnny Depp or Amber Heard were to engage in an intimate relationship soon after all this is happening, uh, and of course this was six years ago that they broke up, right? If either of them were to engage in a relationship that that would be unhealthy, that's a myth. It's, it's not demonstrated by science. So whether or not they're in a relationship soon after, I don't think is really the issue. The issue is, is that the two of them need a lot of treatment. <laughs> If the allegations are accurate, if my conceptualization is accurate, which I can never know, but for someone with at least moderate to severe borderline personality disorder, they need a lot of treatment. They need DBT potentially, but particularly they need a specialist in relational psychotherapies that works long term and specializes with borderline personality disorder. It's a very specialized kind of treatment. It's long term. It could literally take seven, eight, 15 years sort of a thing. I've treated people along those lines and it does take a long time. Sometimes they'll do stints with DBT or other kinds of treatments, maybe even a psychiatrist on the side, but the bulk of recovery is in that corrective experience. And so that's what I would throw out there as a recommendation. Uh, possible sobriety treatment for Amber Heard as well. I don't know. Uh, she didn't seem to have as much of a problem as Johnny Depp did, but there seemed to be some uh, reliance on, on substances in some ways, which a lot of people who are suffering will turn to, and it does compound problems. With Johnny Depp, clearly he needs a lot of drug and alcohol treatment and perhaps group uh, work in terms of 12-step group. And uh, I don't know, maybe he's already done that because it's been six years since all this stuff happened. Uh, but if that were still a, an issue, which I think it is, given the way he was talking on the stand, he would, he would benefit greatly by attaining sobriety. And parallel to that would be treatment for his traumas, which I don't think he's ever really done. So uh, and that could take a long time too. It might not be as long as moderate to severe borderline treatment, but it could be five, 10 years because th it's possible, probable that he suffers from a lot of complex trauma. So I think they would both benefit from that regardless of whether or not they're in a relationship. Ferry Nuff says, what were the key differences between your before and after impressions? Were there any massive surprises for you? End of question. Um, yeah, I was surprised at how severe the allegations were. I know a lot of you knew the allegations prior to the trial, but I didn't. I thought that there were minor pushing incidents, but when Johnny Depp started talking about what he was alleging that she did, the bottle and the finger, I didn't know any, I didn't know that finger incident at all until I saw it in the trial. I was like, what? Just kind of it ballooned from there in terms of the allegations. I was like, whoa, this is like intense. I, I, I was surprised. Uh, but then you ask, what was your most memorable point? That's a good question. I don't know. I would say just Amber Heard's testimony, I think. She was on the stand a lot, maybe the most out of everyone, I don't know. But the way she came across, the defensiveness she had about odd details, you know, like the pledge versus the donation thing, the way she would talk to the jury, you know, I think that will stick with me the longest. You know, other things would be like the grumpy <laughs> um, Camille, Elaine, Dr. Curry, Dr. Hughes, the audio recordings. I, I think the main thing will uh, will be Amber Heard on the stand, Dr. Curry on the stand, and Dr. Hughes on the stand. I think those those things were, they stick with me. And then you go on to say, on a personal note, I wanted to offer my heartfelt thanks for shining light on areas I didn't even know I needed answers to. This trial triggered me so much and yet I felt a strange compulsion to watch it to the bitter end. I'm 100% convinced that your content was what stopped me from being a bumbling manic mess during the odd compulsion of watching the trial. You've helped me understand why I was so triggered and gave me a sense of understanding as to people and the traumas in my life, and which although has not offered me peace, has allowed me to better come to terms with personal experiences. You're a rock star, thank you, heart emoji. Well, you're very welcome, fair enough. And um, thanks for that, I needed that. Tammy from Calgary, Canada says, do you think sentences should be different for people who have a mental health disorder? For example, Amber Heard possibly having borderline personality disorder. Um, yeah, I, I've already, uh, I think, answered that question. So it depends is the answer. Uh, Tarnia from Sydney, Australia says, did this trial surprise you based on your experiences as a therapist? Also, were you surprised by how strongly people in society and media and social media felt about this case? Uh, end of question. Yes, I was surprised by society. If you would have told me prior to the trial that 
the response would be as it was, I'd be like, that doesn't sound likely. I, I think some people will be interested, but not literally everyone. <laughs> I mean, everyone knew about it, or it's just seemingly anyway. YouTube commenter Ms. Corleone from Massachusetts says, Borderline and narcissistic personality disorder patients are not likely to seek treatment, I have heard. What is the more likely scenario for them to seek serious psychological treatment? End of question. Well, first off, it's not true that people with borderline personality disorder don't, don't seek treatment because they often do. I don't know how they compare to the general population, but I would take a guess anecdotally and say that at the very least, borderline individuals seek treatment as much as the general population, if not a lot more, uh, because they know they're suffering. People with borderline are very aware of their suffering and their emotional pain and are in a frequent state of distress, if not a constant state, a chronic state. And so they are often looking for answers. And one of the answers that they will look to almost always, if you live in a community with a therapist, is to go to that therapist. So a lot of people with borderline seek treatment. But people with narcissistic personality disorder, yeah, it's well known in the research that they don't seek treatment very often, but they still seek, seek treatment. Um, they will seek treatment for uh, you know, relationship problems, depression, intimate partner violence, um, addiction, loneliness. Loneliness is a frequent one for people with narcissism because they often do feel lonely at the, the bottom of everything. They've, they've felt lonely their entire life. Marcus says, we have seen some indications of Amber Heard having abandonment issues. Also, her way of splitting Depp into two very different persons also, the way she switches emotions when talking with Johnny Depp during their discussions. Can we really think that her therapist sessions were honest, considering Hughes evaluated her and found no indication of borderline, even though she might not be found to have borderline? Having a therapist not see any indications of the disorder seems highly unlikely if she was being honest in the sessions. End of question. Yeah, so I think what you're ask, asking, Marcus, is given that it's likely that she has at least some degree of borderline, if not severe, how is it possible that her past therapist saw no indication of that? You know, how, that doesn't make any sense. Well, so one, she might not actually have borderline, so we don't know. But if she did, moderate to severe, there are a number of possibilities. One, we did hear that one of the therapists, he refuses or, you know, prefers not to use diagnostic labels of any kind. So, it's possible that either he did see signs of what one might call borderline and just phrased it a different way, or he just actually actively pushes against anything even remotely coming close to a conceptualization. There are therapists out there like that. A lot of humanistic therapists are like this, and there's a lot of wisdom to that model. I don't ascribe to that entirely, but this notion that when we start labeling people as problems, it kind of locks us in and, and prevents the client from being able to grow, prevents us from ha approaching the situation with optimism or with you know openness to the client. And so there are therapists out there like that. And so even if they saw things like distortions and that, that what, and whatnot, they wouldn't even necessarily label it a distortion in their mind because they're more trying to use their model, which I won't, won't go into. Another possibility is that they, the individual therapist did in their minds identify, oh, that's borderline. Clearly she has moderate, severe borderline, uh, but they did not write it down in their records. And when asked about their opinion, they didn't say that. And there are a lot of therapists in that camp too, because they understand that there's so much stigma around borderline. So uh, for example, for me, when I don't know the landscape and say, I have only assessed someone for a little bit of time and I don't, I haven't even talked with the client yet about the conceptualization. Well, actually uh, in both situations, when I'm conferring in that situation, but also when I initially introduced the idea of borderline to a client, I often will not use the word borderline because I don't know if they've absorbed the stigma around it. And I also don't want them Googling it because there's so much misinformation about borderline on the internet. And so I will use relationally traumatized. I will use schema language about abandonment and betrayal, which I think you heard me use a lot of that language in the reaction videos because one, it's more descriptive. And two, those phrases don't have stigma around it. And so I when I will confer with someone, I don't, and I don't know them, I won't, I don't know what they think about borderline. 
So I will use more descriptive language. Now, in the end, with a client, I do want to introduce the word borderline because there are resources around that. But if I ever do introduce that, or I think they might intuit that's what I'm getting at, I have I have a long stick, with, you know, maybe a few minutes where I explain to them that they have to be very careful about going on the internet. They have to be very careful about talking about that in public because there's a lot of myths and misinformation that could really harm you if you read that material or told people. There's another possibility that she, if she does have borderline, which we don't know, was very good at convincing her therapist that her narrative was not distorted and was accurate. And I've seen that before as well. If you have therapists that are untrained, they don't know what they're doing. And I would say a a good percentage are untrained and don't know what they're doing when it comes to personality disorders, or even when it just comes to a client having mild distortions. Like the amount of times that I've heard that it seemed to be anyway, that the therapist was just buying the client client's entire narrative without any sort of skepticism at all or any kind of clinical acumen. I've heard that a lot is the is the point. And so could that have happened with Amber Heard's therapist? Yeah. I don't tend to want to believe that, but uh, but it's you know it's possible. Ninva from Sweden says, are you gonna do a reaction video on Amber Heard's last cross examination? I would really love it. I waited so long for it. End of question. Well, I thought I did, um, <laughs> uh, but you know, I might have just summarized it. And and I get it. I mean, I don't know. I I've known this for a long time in my reaction videos to reality TV shows. But there are times when I'll watch something, but. I think, uh, I don't know if I can provide any kind of value to this. Because that's what I was thinking. I'm always thinking, like, how can I provide value to people? And I don't want to just react, you know, like, whoa, that was weird. Let's watch some more. Like, I don't know. It just doesn't feel like I'm adding any value. I might be confirming or validating your feelings or something, but I don't know. I, I try to use this. I try to use my strengths. I try to use that this is a psychology, you know, YouTube channel. I'm trying to provide the psychological perspective. And, and me just being like, whoa, is, I don't know. I feel like there are other channels that will do that. So there are times when I'm watching something and I'm just like, well, there's not really much I can say. And I'm sure everyone knows what my reaction was to that because that was pretty absurd (laughs) or that was weird or that was funny or that was notable or something, but I don't have anything to say. So by the end of the trial, everything that I could say had already been said. And so uh, if I had watched her cross-examination towards the middle of my experience, then I probably would have said more because there was a lot of information that provoked new statements from me. but And that's the other thing that I try not to do is I try not to repeat myself. I almost never succeed in that. But imagine if I didn't try how often I would repeat myself because I, I don't I don't want to bore people. And so when I was watching her cross-examination, I was like, I'd be like, oh, maybe I could say, I'd be like, well, you've said that three times already, like over the past few weeks. There's there's no point in repeating that and boring the, you know, the viewers. So now, of course, some people interpret that as me being biased and not outing Amber Heard not highlighting the problems in her cross-examination. I don't believe that to be true about me. In fact, by the time she was being cross-examined, and I, th- I believe I did react to it to some extent, to me, the especially since I knew the verdict, the trial was basically over at that point. There was so much evidence pointing in the direction of her lying and her allegations being at least dubious, if not just flat out fabricated, that her exa- her cross examination was deft, but I also was like, I don't know if we need to beat this dead horse. <laughs> Plus, maybe a bias for me was it felt like piling on. All right, final question. Social worker from Montreal, Canada. She says, "How do you do?" I'll say, "Doing well." going on. I'm a mental health clinician and I ended up with the same conceptualization as you about the mutually abusive dynamic between Ms. Hurd and Mr. Depp. Just chiming in here. Was did I did I say that? Did I say that? I mean, I guess I did that again I said if I put my money down it was like a 70-30 mutual abuse with Amber Heard doing 70% of the abuse. So, I guess I did. I don't know. It doesn't I don't if someone asked me what is your concept? What do you think happened? I would say, I don't know. That's that's my conceptualization. <laughs> I wasn't there. If you asked me for my conceptualization, I would say, I don't know. But if I had to put my money down, yeah. A colleague of mine who advocates for more resources for men victimized by women made me realize how insidious gender bias probably tainted my view by asking me to reverse the genders. May I ask if you ever wondered about how you would have conceptualized the dynamic in the trial if the gender roles were reversed? End of question. Yeah, so... What you're saying, social worker from Montreal, is that you conceptualize mutual abuse, but then someone challenged you and said, well, what if the genders were reversed? Would you still believe that it was mutual abuse? And 
I think one that that analogy is interesting for sure, and I did that in, through a, a lot of my reaction videos. I'm like, what if we reverse the gender? Number two is that it's not exactly a fair analogy because of sexism and body size and privilege and that kind of thing. But it is a worthy thought experiment as long as you realize it's not exactly apples to apples, right? And could I have changed my opinion about it? I don't think so because the data was there. And I'm very familiar with women who are abusive and men who are victims. I'm very familiar with that. I've treated many, in fact, if I was just to take a mental survey of, well, when I did a lot of the court mandated work, it was usually men perpetrators. But if I just think about like my non court mandated clients, there isn't an obvious gender trend there. All right, well, that does it for that episode. Tune in next time when I answer more questions. I'm, so I'm gonna do a patron only episode for the patron questions, but I'm also, I have a lot of emails that I have saved f about the trial that I'm also gonna get to because I'm a completist and <laughs> I like to go through everything. So, uh, and by the way, if you send more questions about the trial, unless it's really, a poignant question, I'm probably not going to answer it on the air because I, I kind of want to be done with this whole thing, honestly. So um, it's been great. It's been very satisfying to me professionally and as a as a content provider, but I want to relax a little bit. <laughs> Although I'm starting to go into the teal swan rabbit hole, which is way more complex than I thought it was going to be. But the difference with, just so you know, the difference with the Teal Swan series that I plan on doing, like with the trial, it was happening as I was making videos. And so the news cycle kind of compelled me to get them out as fast as possible because if I released an episode three years from now about the trial, it wouldn't be relevant anymore. So I was coming out real fast. And so it was very, it was a very grueling time in my life the past few months. With the Teal Swan thing, there was a documentary on Hulu recently, but even that was a while ago. But the controversy around her and the content that I can comment on has been going on for many years. So there's no emergency that I have to somehow get all that content out, you know, in a timely manner. So I can I can be a lot more chill. In fact, I can be the sort of chill that I usually am, where I'm just like, well, what do I do today? Do I, you know, whereas with the trial, it was just every day, 16 hours a day. I mean, it was... It was rough, and so I just kind of want to be done with that phase of my life. <laughs> Maybe I'll revisit it at some point, but anyway. So yeah, if you have a comment, leave a comment below, email in, whatever. But if you have a specific question, again, unless it's really like some massively important question, there's a chance that I'm just not going to get to it. And everyone out there, take care of yourself. Know that there's a plurality of experiences and opinion. Your opinion matters. You are worthy of your opinion. You're entitled to your opinion completely. So are other people because we all deserve it. We really, really do.